Hello and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange, a webinar series produced by the UF Thompson Earth Systems Institute's Scientist in Every Florida School Program and Anjari Foundation. Every two weeks, a marine scientist will present on their area of expertise, followed by a question and answer session. Scientist in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEFS program connects and builds long-term relationships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms in Florida and beyond. And Jari Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education, and many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65-foot research vessel, the RV Jari, which completed its 34th expedition earlier this year. And Jari also uses innovative technology, film, and other media to raise awareness and strengthen science education and is pleased to bring their partner scientists and resources to students, teachers, and the public during this exceptional time. Today, we are joined by Angela Rosenberg, who has a range of expertise in marine and environmental science and has combined her love of, for the ocean, marine science, and boating to create Anjari Foundation. She is the president of the foundation and captains the 65-foot research vessel Anjari, which was refitted and purposed for research under Angel Angela's guidance. Angela holds a USCG Merchant Mariner 110 license and STCW and Marine Security cred credentials, as well as several scuba licenses, including rescue and nitrox. Before entering the nonprofit world, Angela worked as a marine scientist conducting field and laboratory research. Angela earned an MBA from the University of South Carolina and an MS in marine geology and geophysics, as well as a bachelor's in marine science and biology from the University of Miami. Without any further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Angela. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, now everyone knows my background, but one of the things you may not know is how interdisciplinary marine science and oceanography are. And when I went to study marine science in college, I was pleasantly surprised and excited to learn that so many different science topics could all fall under marine science. This was something that I was exceptionally excited to not have to pick just one thing and not focus on just one thing, but could actually do a bunch of different stuff and support marine scientists in the field working on several different uh, research topics through RV and JARI. Now over the last three, and three or so years, we've completed 34 different expeditions. We've listed them all here on the left side. And if you go on our website, you can actually select each one and uh, learn a lot more about each expedition and the scientists on board. But I wanted to highlight a couple specific expeditions that were a variety of topics. So for instance, we've done marine technology work uh, supporting submersible research and dives off the uh, Western Atlantic Ocean in the Bahamas. We've done sea turtle research both in the Bahamas as well as in Cape Sable in Florida Bay. We've sampled water across the Gulf Stream to look at metal and element concentrations in those samples. And we've taken plankton samples over in Tampa Bay. In total, we've traveled more than 9,000 nautical miles in the last three and a half years on board RV and Jari. We spent 194 days at sea and we've had over 180 scientists on board. RV Anjari is also really well equipped for diving. And so we've done a lot of different coral reef expeditions. Everything from Conception Island and coral reef assessments with Perry Institute in the Bahamas to working with NOAA and the Dry Tortugas to look at the health of those reefs and everything in between. And we also do a lot of shark research. So we are regularly tagging sharks off of West Palm Beach. And earlier this year, we went and worked with the great hammerheads off of Bimini during their annual migration. And last, in prior years, we even worked with Discovery Channel to do a Shark Week episode on oceanic white tips and a Tiger Beach episode with National Geographic for Shark Fest. But before we could have all this fun, there was a lot of work that went into setting up the research vessel operations. And the first thing, slide slow, was the setting up of the research vessel itself. So we had to find a vessel that was going to work for our purposes, where we wanted a coastal vessel with a shallow draft, not a lot of depth in the water, so that we could uh, go into shallow areas to look at coral reefs, um, coastal environments, even mangrove environments. And so we found this 65 foot Grand Alaskan that was already set up with a lot of great 
workspaces and areas that would be great for research. So first we have, of course, a galley where um, all our cooking's done. Uh, the vessel has a huge flybridge, which is the upper deck. So here you can see steering, you have a whole 360 degree view, lots of seating, a big area where you can put a smaller boat and a tender to run around, deck space for freezers and other equipment. And also on the stern, has a nice size cockpit that has high sides here and well protected for setting up dive gear or other equipment while you're underway. There was some upgrading that needed to be done. So first it was safety and electronics and mechanical upgrading. So in the pilot house, we put in all new navigation systems so we could have the most accurate GPS and details for expeditions. We put in cameras, we put in uh, EPIRBs and AIS systems for safety and new life rafts and sa other safety equipment like PFDs. In the engine room, we were already well equipped with one generator. We added a second large generator, so we had plenty of power and we did a lot of routine maintenance on the engines and other mechanicals to bring them up to speed. The biggest transformation was in the lab space. So the vessel didn't come with a lab, we had to do it ourselves. And this was a perfect setup where you have both outdoor and indoor lab space on one level connected. So we started with the aft deck and where you normally have seating, we just removed the cushions and table and we put in a big workbench. Inside, it was a living room. So there was a couch and a chair and we removed all that. We put in chemical grade countertops and a nice big lab sink to have um, house all kinds of science work. And then finally, you need some comfort as well. So we had a bunch of staterooms. So we have six scientists that we can sleep overnight as well as a nice lounging area after work to, or before you go to bed to watch a nice movie or have dinner. So we thought, all right, we did our refit and we were ready to go, but not quite yet. There's another important component to a research vessel and that's the crew. So like any boat, you have a captain on board who directs all the ship functions, drives, navigates, makes sure everyone is safe. But on a research vessel, you have two sub crews. You have the vessel operations side of things, but you also have the research vessel, um, research operations side of things. And the vessel operations is like any boat. You have a cook, so you can plan meals and um, prepare meals for everyone on board. You have an engineer to support uh, the machinery and engines and all the mechanics of the vessel. And you have a mate or deckhand, uh, sometimes more than one, who will help run deck, whether it's anchoring or tying up at the dock or helping the captain with various things. But on the research side of things, you have a totally different crew that you don't have on, on a normal vessel. You have a research technician who's gonna help prepare the laboratory and work with the scientists to collect data and use the instruments a dive technician who's going to help with all the scuba equipment when that's required for research, and a film photographer who is always recording and taking photos of all the operations that are going on on the vessel. And then there's also the chief scientist. And the chief scientist, although not truly part of the research crew, is someone who serves um, to lead the research team and communicate directly with the captain. So on a large research vessel, each one of these people serves there is an individual crew member, each role. But on Anjari, we multitask. We only have a small crew of two to four people and we're doing a lot of jobs all at once. So for instance, uh, after our Shark Week episode with our three crew members, we were all quite busy that week. So now we have our vessel, we have the crew, we gotta be ready to go, almost. The last thing you really need to understand when you're working on a vessel is a research vessel is how the science is done because you have to be able to plan the logistics, make sure you have the equipment and the itinerary and everything you need to accomplish the research mission. So like any science, uh, scientific method simplified here, you're gonna make an observation or have a question or wanna test a theory. You're gonna then figure out how are you gonna do that? What's your method for doing it? You're then gonna set out and actually run that method and run that experiment. And finally, you're going to look at the results, draw a conclusion, maybe you have to go back and do something again, what did you discover? Well, field work and research vessels, they're required, they help with the first three steps. And so now I'm gonna take you through a couple of different expeditions that we've done and sort of run through this with you. Some of my favorites from the last year. So first is the green sea turtles in Andros in the Bahamas. This expedition was run by Annabelle Brooks from Earthwatch 
And she has found, and other Bahamian scientists have also seen, that green sea turtles have tumors around them and they think it's caused by a virus. So the question was, is this virus present in green sea turtles all around the Bahamas or only in specific areas? So we headed out to Andros, a very remote location that you can only access by boat, to look at all these different tidal channels where you see turtles and look to see what, um, if these turtles had a virus and what we find, if there even are turtles there. Well, the good news is when we got there and we got our small boat, um, in our small boat and went up the different mangrove uh, tidal channels, yes, there were tons of sea turtles there. So that was the first good news. And as you're going up these small channels and you're trying to find these turtles and they're fast, that's all I have to say. They're, they're super fast. So now you're thinking, how are we going to actually look at these turtles and examine them and see if they have tumors? Well, it's quite simple actually. Get in your small boat, you put on your snorkel gear and you have your dive team, if you will, and you follow these turtles along the um, channels. And at some point they get a little tired and you hope your dive team jumps in and grabs a turtle. Once they grab the turtle, then you bring the turtle on the boat right there on site. You look to see if it has any ID tags already on it. None of these turtles did. So we put an ID tag on them. And for sea turtles, you usually actually put two. They're just small little metal tags. Like if you're getting your ears pierced, same kind of thing. And uh, you have two in case one falls off. So you record that ID tag. Then you're gonna look and take a picture of the turtle shell and look for any markings like these shark markings right here that may uh, show a former predatory attack like a tiger shark that probably tried to take a bite out of this guy and he escaped. Then you're gonna weigh the turtle, um, just like you would weigh your, a normal baggage. Uh, then you're gonna measure the turtle. And finally, we're gonna look to see if it has any tumors. And for instance, here, there is a tumor that you can see there that we're measuring. So we did find the tumors uh, on the green sea turtles and andros. A second uh, expedition that I really enjoyed was a two week trip with Perry Institute for Marine Science around all of the Northern Bahamas. We completely circumnavigated it, stopping three to four times a day along this track to dive reefs and uh, survey using several different techniques, the health of those reefs. So everyone, all the scientists got in the water. And as you can see here, there's, they either lay out their survey tape and they have their measuring stick or they're laying out their line with markings along it. And they're following that line and they're recording everything they see along that line. So they're recording whether it's a different coral species, algae cover, um, if they run across a fish such as this lionfish, an invasive species, or one of the more at-risk species like a Nassau grouper here. And so we did that along the entire transect. Then, if you'll recall, later um, last year in the fall, Hurricane Dorian came through. And as a Category 5 hurricane, it demolished a lot of the Bahamas, as you can see here from these drone photos. And so Perry Institute called me up and said, we should do this again. We should need a pre and post Hurricane Dorian assessment. Let's look and uh, compare, go back to the same sites and see if anything's changed. So that's what we did. And we got back in on the boat, back in the water, and we found some reefs hadn't changed at all. They were exactly as we had seen them just months earlier. Other reefs, um, you saw like coral bleaching, like this white coral here. So there was some effect of temperature, most likely. Um, and then in certain areas, as you might expect, there's uh, actual debris from the hurricane that washed offshore. So you have a lawnmower here or a tire and a bunch of tree trunks that um, were blown into the ocean from the hurricane. And here you even have a huge coral head that this is actually several meters across that fractured in half. So we did find some big differences and we're planning to head out there again this year. But you know, when you come back after a research expedition and the scientists go home, the crew's not done. The crew still has to collect all the film and photos that they um, had collected over the course of the trip and put it on the website and log it. Uh, we go through all of our accounting and all the related costs. We have to, of course, clean the vessel and do all the laundry, uh, make sure all of our equipment's good, do any routine maintenance that might need done or repairs, replenish inventory and parts, hopefully if we have some time, rest and get ready for the next trip. So Anjari Foundation 
uh, one of our goals is to share what we're doing with every expedition. And so we hope that you'll follow along with us on our website at andrari.org or on social media and learn more about each expedition, the scientists involved and um, the research we're doing. Thank you. Angela, thank you so much. Um, we are going to transition into our Q&A section of today's presentation. And our first question comes from Sarah, who asks, how do you work with lab equipment when the waters are really choppy in the ocean? Uh, so every piece of equipment has a different uh, capacity, I would call it, uh, and it's always based on safety. So the captain makes the final decision. There's times that it's too rough and we actually don't work with the equipment. Um, and we have to wait for the weather to clear. And there's other times when we know um, we're well experienced with that equipment and we know we can work in two, three, four foot uh, seas just fine and safely. So it varies from one piece of equipment to the next and who your crew is and who your scientists are that you're working with. Our next question comes from Tice who asks, why do you tag turtles? And what do you do if you catch a turtle that's already been tagged? So you tag turtles because for those tags, they're just ID tags that I showed you. So you're tagging them because if a researcher goes out and um, catches one again, or if a fisherman catches one on his line or in a net, they know that this turtle has been sampled before and has been measured before, and they can report that um, back to the scientist. Now, if you, um, so that's, that's the general purpose. What was the second part of that question? What do you do if you catch a turtle that's already been tagged? So if you catch it, you can go online and there's several different um, places where you can report and find the scientist um, and the ID number on it and report it to the scientist that you found it and where and when you found it. James, James asks, why do you think some coral reefs were impacted by Hurricane Dorian, but others weren't? So uh, the scientists at Perry Institute are working on just that. And there's a lot of theories right now that we need to go out and test. Uh, but one of the main thoughts is a hurricane with its cyclonic movement would affect reefs, for instance, on the northern side of the islands a lot more than on the southern side because of how the waves and wind are coming onshore versus offshore. So we saw a lot of places where wind was coming offshore, we got more debris because we had trees coming in, we had um, you know, the lawnmowers and other things coming off the coast into the ocean, but a lot of the real damage to the reefs was on the northern side where you had the wind and waves coming on and beating it. Cameron asks, do you record videos during underwater assessments and studies? Yes, we do. Um, we, there's two different groups who are filming for the coral reef work. Um, one is our crew who's filming for the sake of sharing science and the methods um, with the public. But then there's also a scientific crew that is filming for a uh, real high resolution uh, imagery so that they can actually go back to their lab and back to the offices and look at the details because um, when they're not out there, they might not remember and they can review it all. Jack asks, have you ever had to abort a mission because of weather conditions? all the time. Not totally aboard it, but uh, we, we have delayed leaving the dock before. We've had to go in and take uh, refuge in an anchorage or in a marina because some bad wind and waves were coming through for a couple of days. So that's just part of uh, working on a boat and especially with the research vessel because it's even harder because you have to actually use equipment. So usually you're more limited. Uh, we're constantly keeping track of weather and planning accordingly. Kylie asks, how many years of college do you need to become a marine biologist? Uh, it depends exactly what you want to do in marine biology. So I have, I went to like four year college um, undergrad and then I did a three year master's. And I worked as a marine scientist for a number of years before doing this. I know people who've gone on and done PhDs to be marine scientists and they've, that takes another probably four years on top of that. But I also know people who are marine scientists who just did undergrad and are a research technician on a boat or um, working in a lab, uh, helping out there so as a lab assistant. So it depends exactly what you want to do. Deborah is curious, where does your funding come from? Uh, so the, are we talking about funding for the nonprofit or are we I'll answer both. <laughs> so the, 
uh, funding for these different expeditions comes from the scientists. So scientists have funding through various sources, a lot of times government funding uh, through NSF or some other agency. There's also private funding through a lot of foundations or institutes that uh, are supporting different types of research. And the scientist secures the funding uh, and then covers the costs associated with that expedition. Sarah asks, did you know what you wanted to do when you were in high school or what was your journey like to becoming a captain? That's a big question. Uh, so in high school, as I was graduating high school, uh, my senior year, I realized I wanted to go into marine biology, which is why I applied to University of Miami. So I did intend to do that and I wanted to go into some science career. Uh, I actually didn't plan on being a captain until I was more in graduate school and I actually wanted to get out in the field more and I saw that I was very good at helping scientists uh, kind of navigate, literally navigate um, field work and, and support them in that way. And so then that kind of became my niche and something that I worked towards. Rebecca asks, what recommendations do you have for people who are interested in getting into this kind of work? Um, if you want to go uh, the science route, you should plan on going to, um, at a minimum, an undergraduate college um, and study some sort of science uh, topic. If you want to work on a vessel, uh, I personally think that a four-year degree is helpful, but you definitely don't need one. You really need a ton of experience and actually recorded hours working at sea so that you can go and um, apply with the US Coast Guard to get your license and you build up your license um, over time and you have to maintain that as well as a bunch of other certifications. So for me, it's really unique and exciting that I have both the marine science background and the boating um, skills. And that's kind of a great combination, but you can do either or as well. Steven is curious, what's the scariest thing that's happened to you while you've been out at sea? Serious thing. Probably, probably some mechanical failure that we had to fix in rough waves. <laughs> That's never fun. I guess piggybacking off that question, Eva asks, have you ever had to stay in a big storm because you couldn't find cover for safety? Um, we've definitely had to ride through storms. So we have been many times out in the middle of nowhere uh, miles and miles and miles away from land and uh, and an anchorage or a marina and a storm has come up and we are always heading towards safety. We don't just stay out there, um, but we watch the weather really closely. And if it's something that's passing, we, you know, we make sure we're heading in the direction that we're going to get through it the fastest um, and the safest. So, but it definitely happens. Brent asks, are you seeing evidence of climate change during your research expeditions at sea? Uh, yeah, generally, yes. Uh, that was something that really the chief scientist should uh, answer. But from my experience, yes, on the reefs, uh, we definitely see it. Joe asks, do you ever take school groups out to sea? Uh, we have a couple of programs that we're working on locally in West Palm Beach to give uh, students the opportunity to learn from scientists hands-on. And so that's, that's the uh, most that we do with school groups. Laurel is curious, how far do you usually travel on the research vessel? Uh, well, we've gone 9,000 miles now. So I guess the longest runs we make straight will be, I think the longest run we ever made without stopping or going into a dock or anything was 24 hours. So, a while. Nathaniel's curious, what are some good animals you encounter on your expeditions? Oh, they're all good animals. So, especially in the Keys, we see dolphins all the time. Uh, they like to play in the wake and Jari has a really great wake for dolphins. Uh, we see sharks regularly, even when we're not researching sharks. When you're diving on the reefs, there's sharks all the time, especially in the Bahamas. Um, we've seen octopus. Uh, we've seen some just really unique, uh, like eels and things that you don't see as often when you're out there. Um, we even get excited when we just see like large lobsters. So everything's exciting. Michael asks, 
Is RV Anjari a typical vessel or is it unique? Uh, RV Anjari is definitely unique. Uh, it is, first it was made out of a, what used to be a private vessel and we converted it for this purpose. A lot of research vessels are made, uh, built for research purposes. So that's something very different. Um, most vessels that I've been on are not as luxurious uh, when it comes to research as this one is. And we're also owned by and operated by a nonprofit where a lot of the research vessels, especially the bigger ones out there, um, are actually owned and operated by universities and uh, government oversight committees. Emily is wondering, what, school, what subject in school uh, helped you develop the skills that you need as a captain? As a captain, I would go with math. Math subjects probably the most helpful for navigating and, um, and any like technology kind of stuff too. Like when you're doing mechanical things, you're working on um, electrical and plumbing. I mean, all those sort of skills that you never thought you would use and then you're using every day. And our final question is gonna come from Jack and he asks, what type of sea, cum sea cucumbers do you see? What type of we don't see very many sea cucumbers actually. So, and the ones we do, I actually don't know the species of them. So I'd have to get back to you on that. No problem. Angela, do you have any final thoughts you would like to leave our attendees with? Uh, no, I stay safe out there guys. All right, then I'm gonna pass things over to Stephanie for some closing remarks. We wanna thank everyone for joining us on the call today to learn a little bit more about research vessel operations and what it takes to run one. A special thanks to Captain Angela and the RV and Jerry crew um, for taking time with us today. Once again, our Ocean Expert Exchange will take place every other week at 3 p.m. as part of a collaboration between the Anjari Foundation and the Scientists in Every Florida School program. You can learn more about our programs and more about Angela by visiting uh, the websites that you will find in this recording. The recording will be found at the UF Thompson Earth Systems YouTube channel. Again, you can find this full recording related educational research materials, as well as our websites at that uh, site. And again, we look forward to seeing you next time for our upcoming event on May 25th. This will be our next Ocean Expert Exchange. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.